Hello friends of .NET, I'm Emil Landworth and you can find me on Twitter at TerraJobs. So in today's episode we are going to continue our journey towards emitting IL for our language. So last time what we did is we basically started to uh, write some stuff into MS Build so that our compiler gets invoked and then we emit uh, an actual assembly to disk. Um, last time we cheated a lot and we ended up effectively just uh, emitting the static hello world program. Um, but basically the idea is that we want to uh, walk the entire language, the, the entire bound tree that we already have, and effectively emit IL for all the constructs that we have. Um, it will probably take us a while, so today my goal would be that we get the general structure going, where we walk all the functions, and we get at least all the, um, you know, the basics going, like function calls and literals, so we can at least parse and emit in Hello World for real, rather than just emitting a fixed version of IELTS statements. Um, hopefully it will be a lot of fun. Um, it, I have not prepared this episode much, so I will effectively discover on the fly what we need to do, and hopefully that doesn't go too bad. Um, I'm not sure how good my mic is. I'm pretty sure there is some sort of background humming going on. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm fairly confident there is some ground loop issue with my equipment here that I recently changed quite a few USB devices and apparently that does not super go, uh, go super well with the, with the mic, but it is what it is. Like you can only do so much, especially when you try to order parts on Amazon right now, that will take forever to get to you. So it is what it is. You have to make do with what you have. All right, let's start with our pull request again. Yeah, what happened here? So this is our, uh, I mean, report, and we found the same type name in different assemblies. We get a Minsk name, which is our type name, and a metadata name. And yeah, that seems <laughs> a typo, right? So we basically check for Minsk name. If it's null, if it's null, then we write Minsk name. Yeah, that's clearly not what we meant. We clearly meant metadata name. Awesome. All right. Let me pull down those changes. Let me check out a branch. Uh, what is it? Uh, episode 19, I believe. Is it 19? I think it is, but if not, we'll find out. Um, da -dum -da -dum. All right, so here's our general structure that we currently have. So we get our emitter gets called, we pass in the program, the module name, the references, and the output path. And then the first thing we do is we resolve all the references, uh, or I should say resolve all the types then methods for built-in stuff like console.write line. And then we create our program type. And then here is where the hardwired stuff starts. So I think the first thing I want to do is I want to actually instantiate the emitter. So instead of having a static class, let's make it a sealed class. Um, and then what state does this guy need? Yeah, let's move this stuff mostly to the constructor. And so the constructor would get uh, all of this stuff. Now let's move the whole thing for now. Um, Let's move all of this stuff. <clears throat> uh, 
And then let's basically get the general structure going here. So we need a private diagnostic bag. Diagnostics, diagnostics, new diagnostic bag. Let me say public uh, immutable array of diagnostic get diagnostics and this is just diagnostics uh, to immutable array. <clears throat> Jesus. All right. And then instead of doing all of this, we will just say var emitter is new emitter. We pass in our program, the module name, the references, the output path. And then we say, uh, actually, we don't do that. We say public immutable array um, diagnostic emit. Flow wise, that makes more sense, right? Return emitter, emit. Something like that. The video is called 18 though. Hmm. Did I not update the, probably did not update the titles. I thought I did. Um, uh, I can't remember where is this guy. Um, then I stream it for now. Yeah. Yep. We should probably do this. We should probably say. All right. Dum, 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 dum. So then we have at least this one going. I think it's a bit weird to start. So this would be diagnostics, of course. Yeah, something tells me that all of this stuff here probably should go to emit itself. And then I can say diagnostics. Right, that seems reasonable. Then I think we need a bunch of fields in order to store this. So, yeah. You probably want to do this. You probably need the assembly definition. Um, uh, boom, boom, boom. You probably want to store those guys. And we probably want to store this guy. So let's do it like this. So we keep our import at the top and then the stuff we emit is below that. Mm. 
And then I guess we don't need any of this stuff here. We can probably take this uh, down here, right? Then we can replace this guy with this guy. Probably take this guy here. And then we have effectively some structure going here. And there's still an error somewhere. What is happening? Oh, I need to make these fields everywhere as well. Probably in here. Some the definition. Some the definition. Looks reasonable. All right, <clears throat> let's test this just for the just for the sake of the argument. Let's assume it's not working. Not that I would ever make mistakes like this, but that's impressive. All right, let's um, commit what we have. Because this diff is going to be annoying. And then we just call this convert emitter to a non static class. And then we say git pr create. Um, Episode 19. Um, all right, pull request is open. Um, yeah, probably should have marked this. I mean, not that it makes a huge difference here, but like just for basic sanitary needs. We need, I think we want to have this as a draft, convert to draft. Yes. All right. So now that we have this thing going, I think what I want to do now is I just want to start walking the structure, right? So, um, yeah, probably should have done this like this. So it's a bit more readable. Um, yeah, let me actually fix that really quick because that would annoy me later. I don't have it. Um, and then basically the way this will work is we will, um, instead of doing this hardwired here, we will have a loop over all the functions that we have in our program and we will do this for every single function. So I think that's where we're going to start. Uh, so let's say for each var bound, uh, I guess, function in program dot functions. We'll do this. But we will have to do this as a two pass as well, because the first path is we have to create the methods. 
then we probably have to remember them. So we have to say var, let's say methods, this new dictionary from a function symbol to a method definition. <coughs> so this way we know what a particular function was emitted to. And then we can say methods add function comma, uh, I guess main method in this case. We would call this method. Of course, these things here, I guess it needs to be the method.name. Uh, function.name probably. Um, and I guess this is not a function, this is a key value pair. Okay, fine, be like that. So this is a function with body. And then I can say var function is function with body key. Um, right, and then the main method is methods with program dot main function. Um, we probably have to check whether we have one. If main function is not null, then we set the entry point, otherwise we don't. Um, and then we have to say this thing again for each of our Body, uh, our method is methods function, right? And then we do this for now. So now Um, that seems reasonable. For some definition. Sorry for being late. No worries, this is not school. <laughs> it's totally fine to be late to this. Also, the cool thing is it's recorded, so it really isn't such a thing as being late to a lecture when it's recorded. At least that's what I told myself. All right, so we have this guy going now. So that means we at least have the basic structure. I suspect we need to remember that in our uh, basic program structure as well. Um, let's make this a thing here. It's a bit unfortunate that this is no longer read only because that's a state that we construct lazily, but hey. You know what? We can actually make this read only because definitely know that we need this guy here, so we don't have to do that. And then let's call this. Okay, with the tie definition, we probably need as a field now. Otherwise, this is going to be annoying. Okay, so then let's emit this guy and we call this extract method and we call this um, 
No, let's actually not do that. But let's do this. And let's call this emit method. And then we call this Yeah. Um, fine, be like that. We call this emit uh, I guess statement for the IL processor. So you have to pass that guy down now. For the body which what is the body? Is that a block statement? Okay, that's fine then. Let's do that. So this is, I guess, the basics. So we have at least something that walks every method. Call this emit method body. Yeah, I generally like reordering things here and these kind of things top to bottom. Um, probably should have done that here as well. Function. Yeah, let's use our names here. So emit function declaration, I guess, and then emit function body. And then this would be key. And then let's inline these guys. Right, so this way it follows our normal structure. All right, so now here's where the fun starts. I guess I guess we can say for each of our statement um, in method, no, sorry, in body, we can say emit statement. The reason we can do that is because we know that the structure is flattened. Um, right, we only have a block statement at the very top. Every, every nested body was already removed in the lower. And so that means you only need this function here, which is basically the, the dispatcher for, for all the stuff. So in here, we now have to say switch statement kind. And um, it's probably helpful. Um, can I do this here? I swear to God, there was at some point an action that basically just emitted all the, the cases. For some reason, this stopped showing up. Anyway, so we have these guys here. Um, so let's talk about what can actually happen. So we have case, bound, node, kind, right? And then we can say, um, Let's call this mid 
IL processor bound statement and then break. And of course it would have helped if I would have spelled this correctly. Bound node kind. All right, so as I said, block statements can't occur. Uh, if statements can't occur because we have lowered them away into go tools. While, can't do, while do for can't occur, we can delete those as well. Label statements still can, go to statements can, conditional go tools can, return can, and expression can as well. So we can then say default, throw a new exception, um, unexpected note kind. Uh, statement kind. Yeah. So actually, let's leave this throw statements in because we will not fill in everything probably. Um, does the order of declarations matter in IL? It does not. Um, I mean, it does in the sense that um, you generally want to be item potent. So if you emit the same program multiple times, you ideally have deterministic compilation and produce the same or like basically the same bits on disk, so that incremental builds and other things work the way you want. Um, so in that sense, if you, a, if you have a compiler, you generally want to avoid the situation where if you run you know, the same source code twice because of threading or circumstantial issues, you emit things differently. Um, I don't think there's a spec in IL that says that you need to emit things in order of declaration in the source, but that's pretty much what most compilers do because it's the easiest thing um, and it kind of resonates with what people expect when they do reflection and they you know ask for methods um, or fields that they happen to get back in declaration order. Um, I think the only case where it really matters is structs where the members of the struct because there usually are you know layout issues and other stuff where the order matters but I think spec wise I think that requires uh, you know, having an attribute on the struct that says sequential layout or explicit layout, otherwise it's considered uh, arbitrary. So we can probably do the same thing here, right? We can probably start doing the same thing here. We would say, um, uh, we would say emit expression for statement expression. Um, well, not expression statement, expression. Um, let me need this guy, which now walks all the expressions. So as I said earlier, right, the way this will work is that emit expression will effectively now start to emit, um, you know, push and pop operations on the stack. So in IL, so now we have to, for an expression statement, because we basically drop the return value of the expression on the floor, we have to emit a pop statement. However, our expression statements don't always produce a value, right? If you call a, a function that doesn't have a return, like a void function, um, the expression type is void, in which case we don't have to, or not don't have to, we must not emit a pop instruction because there's nothing to pop off the stack. So we now basically say if statement expression uh, type is not type symbol void, then we say IL processor emit, uh, what is it, opcodes uh, pop. And then our expression statement is already done. And then we do the same thing here. We say switch expression.kind, uh, node kind. Then we go over the expressions. Oops. Uh, case bound node kind whatever is here. 
Um, let me say emit this guy for IL processor and then cast to this instance the expression and then we say break um, and then same thing here I guess we need a default handler to make sure that we know when we screw things up and forgot something so errors should not occur because otherwise we should not be called in the first place so literals can occur, variable expressions can occur, assignments can occur, unary can occur, binary can occur, call and conversion expressions can all occur. And then I guess for my own sanity, let's just consistently use the name, uh, I made my life miserable here, uh, not nod, node, Consistency is an important thing. Makes your life easier. So if you've ever done comp something like this, you may have seen the visitor pattern that some compilers use. I, um, I have to say, I use visitors and I'm not a fan. I think walking the tree manually seems much nicer because you can also pass in arguments, right? So every Everything we have, whether it's our type checker or our, you know, emitter, it's like you want to walk structure in a different way, pass in different arguments, and, you know, walking a tree is not that big of a deal, and strictly speaking, you need to know the, 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 the you know, kind of nodes and how to handle them anyway, for the most part, because you have to handle all cases, right, or you have to know which cases can occur. So I'm not sure visitor buys you much. Um, I mean, where visitor really shines is replaces, right? If you want to replace a node, it's easier to use a visitor for that uh, because then the base implementation can basically do the right things with updating all the nodes. Anyway, so here we are. So we have our basic structure going. Now let's actually think about what can happen in Hello World. So in Hello World, um, we will have an expression statement, which we handle already, check. We will have a literal expression. So let's do that. Let's say, um, yeah, what literals can we have? Well, we, in our language, we have ints, we have bools, we have strings, right? Do we have anything else that can happen as a literal? Okay, any doesn't have a literal. Bool and string have the truths. Arrow clearly doesn't have one and void doesn't have one. I mean, strictly speaking, this would be null, but we don't have a null literal in our language yet. So we should, but we don't. Um, so now we can basically say if node kind, no, if node type is type symbol int, else if node type type symbol Uh, int and then let's say this is string and then this is bool and then of course else uh, throw a new exception unexpected uh, literal Something like that. Um, so the way bools work in IL, let me actually show. Um, if you look at shop lab IO, so when we look at how var x equals true. And we look at IL. So the way, as you can see here, is the instruction here is load constant integer four, meaning a four byte integer, value one, right? So the way true is represented is as, a, as an int with the value one. Um, if we say false, then it's just zero. 
So basically in IL, uh, bools are not really a thing. They are effectively just um, integer values. So all we have to do now is we say um, IL processor emit opcodes um, load constant i4 and 0. Right? Load. Okay, say value. Value is bool node value. And then we can say var instruction is this one or this one. Right? So then our bools are done. Uh, ints, same thing. So the way we would do an int in IL um, is effectively just we say uh, opcodes load constant. And you can see there's multiple versions here. So effectively, IL tries to be compact in the instruction set. So there's specific byte encodings for particular values. So, you know, the values 0 to for some reason, eight, not nine, <laughs> are common enough that they have special encodings. And so this one is basically saying, well, there is a value and the value is basically passed as another argument to the instruction. So this is pretty common that you also see in processors um, uh, where they basically try to make the encoding um, effectively more compact. Because if you have to have a four byte intermediate, not intermediate, immediate argument, right, your encoding of the instruction is now four bytes longer, right? But the values one, two, three, five, zero in particular are super common. So it makes sense to have dedicated instructions that just say this is a constant of, you know, and the value is zero. So you don't have to burn in, what is it, like four bytes for the instruction plus four bytes for the operand, right? I hope that explanation makes sense. Um, so we say value here is a node value the lowercase cast to an int and you know we we don't care right now we just use the, the generic expression here we don't use the specialized ones uh, we could but i'm lazy um we want to get going at some point strings same thing uh we say load string and then the argument is the string Now we have emitted literals. Okay, so now I think the only thing we need to do now is our call. Yeah, so one thing we should probably be doing, um, and we can do one of two things here. Yeah, let's just hard code it right now. If node function is built in functions, what is it? Input. No, actually, sorry, uh, print. Then uh, yeah, let's do it this way for now. So generally speaking, we now have to emit all arguments. So first of all, we say for each uh, var argument in node.arguments, we have to say emit expression for the argument for the IL processor, the argument, right? Because the arguments are, I'm pretty sure they say, yeah, these are just expressions that are passed to the function. We do them left to right. In IL, you also push left to right. Uh, so that's what we do here. And then after this is done, now we have to call the function. And so we can now say, well, if it's the built-in function, then we say uh, IL processor emit um, opcode call. And then the reference, the method reference we have to use is our console write line reference. Um, else if node function is built-in functions 
uh, what is that, input. Uh, what was the other one? Um, round. Um, and in all other cases, we have already recorded the function. So in that case, we say method reference, or I should say method definition, is uh, methods for our node function, right? That's the function we are calling. Um, and then we say it is this guy. So you can either call a method, you can either pass in a reference to a method or a definition, which has to be in your, in your assembly. So now we have emitted calls, at least for most of them. And um, maybe that's enough to compile Hello World. Yeah, .NET rub. That's the rub. Um, did Imo say uh, why he isn't streaming on YouTube too? Um, so the reason I'm not streaming on YouTube live anymore is because I just want to have one live audience to deal with, not two. Because one of the problems that I have is that um, it's a bit weird with YouTube if you have basically split your, argument, your audience into two sets. One is on YouTube, one is on, on Twitch. So basically my um, approach is to say Twitch is effectively where my live stuff happens and then the recording later on also goes on YouTube. It's pretty common, many streamers are doing this because Twitch doesn't really archive. Twitch only archives for I think two weeks or something. And uh, then basically your recording is lost. So I stream live to YouTube, but it's private so that the live audience has to be on Twitch, if that makes sense. Uh, Cecil has a body optimized macros method which turns the opcodes into their smaller variants if possible. Nice. I did not know that. That is awesome. JB, you are my personal hero. That is amazing. Just call it at the end. Okay, let's do this. That seems like an easy fix. Um, it is on body. Okay, so that means we do it in the method body here. So we say um, method body optimize macros. No, where is it? I'll, I'll processor optimize macros. No. Method optimize macros. No. Hmm. Where do you see this? You need to using monocessal rocks. Okay. Ah. Interesting. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so this is one of those things where fun, fun happens, right? So let's actually look at the IL that we emitted. Oh, actually we're very close. We're very close. So what's missing here is the return. I said this earlier, right? I said like the thing with IL is that you always have to have a red at the end. So this is one of those things where, yeah, what I will do right now is not going to be great, but it will work. So what we really want to do, so basically what I will do is I will just go here and say red, um, but really this should not be here. This is a hack. Um, we should make sure uh, that our bound tree always uh, um, has explicit returns. 
So in other words, like functions that don't return values, there's nothing in our language that requires you to write return, right? But the bound tree should have that. Um, so doing that right now is a bit weird. And also we should probably say if, if function, what is it? Um, type is type symbol void. Yeah, I guess. So the reason I'm saying void is because if it's not void, then we already enforce the developer wrote a return statement. So let's try this again. Hello world. I know this is actually really compile. We don't, we don't emit a hard-coded one right now. We are actually emitting it. And so if you now look at this, it just has three statements. It has our load string, hello world, it has the call instruction and return. And what is nice is that we should be able to actually edit this program now. Like real human beings and stuff. <laughs> like if you say, uh, let's say, hello, uh, hello world on Wednesday morning. By the way, the reason this is so slow is the combination of two things. One, we actually compile the compiler every single time to make sure we run the latest version of the compiler too. And our compiler is not really fast. We are still resolving against like, what is it, 100, 100 assemblies or something. So we should probably optimize that as well. But for the time being, I take it. So I think that's enough as a, as a, as a commit. Okay, let's undo this. Um, actually, let me, let me do this independently because that's cool enough to just have an independent commit for that. Okay, so this is all basic structure. Yeah, and then let me just go Let me call this uh, emit enough for hello world. And then we add this guy here to just have it as an independent commit and say um, optimize uh, IL instructions. All right, let's push this. All right, so now let's talk about um, something a little bit more sophisticated. So I think what I want to do now, the program I want to make work, is something like this. Let name equals input semicolon. Gee, what did I do? Uh, and let me say hello name, right? So two things we need to make work for this. Um, I guess three things. We need to import console.readline. Um, probably we need to say, what's your name? Um, so let's start with console.readline. So that should be fairly straightforward. Um, we just have to import this guy. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, console dot read line reference. This is read line and 
it takes no arguments. So this would be array dot empty of string. And then we add this guy here. Okay. Let's swap them. I don't know why, but it seems it seems I want to have I want to import the read line before the write line for some reason. Feels more natural. And then I think in uh, what is it? Emit function, emit call. Uh, we do this guy here. Let's do input and then print. And this would be console.readline. Okay, so let's start with that. Yeah, we don't have comments. <laughs> that would be useful right now. Yeah. Hello world. Is that live? Yes, that is live. Hello, Tom, by the way. <laughs> See, now we have, we print, but nothing happens. <laughs> what happens here? Oh, because I call print, not input. <laughs> I guess it doesn't compile anymore, right? <laughs> All right, so we have to say, uh, because input doesn't take any arguments. For some reason, my Google Home decided that I wanted to talk to it. Um, oh, that's, a, that's quite an output line here. The command.net run whoop, failed. Yeah, when the compiler doesn't compile, it's bad. Oh, yeah, so now we wait forever because this is a, a not happening. Okay, so I say immo and then hello world. Cool, okay, so we can at least call input, which is nice. So now let's go back here to what we used to have. What's your name? We input, and then we do that. So now in order for this to make sense, we have to uh, deal with, uh, actually let's do one thing as well here. So this should also work if I put the whole thing into a function block, right? If I say function, main right this should still work all right so now i think the thing we need to deal with is bound variables so we said um actually that's the only thing i need to deal with don't we have a hell um yeah we also have binary operators so let's print this out as well. So just that we have to do less work at once. So now let's make variables work. Um, so variables, there's two things, right? There is the uh, variable expression, which is basically referencing a variable. And then there is the um, uh, uh, declaring a variable, which is here. So that is interesting. So I did not think about this earlier. So let's go back to the function body. So when we emit a function body, the way globals work in IL, not globals, locals work in IL is that they are declared, I believe at the beginning of the method. Let me check. What is this thing called here? Method body locals. Um, variables, yes. Add. Probably Cecil is helping us. We can probably do this at any point.
which means we can probably cheat. The only problem is I don't know the body. Yeah, so let's make our life easier. And let's say uh, two things. We need a dictionary from, uh, uh, screw it, variable symbol to, what is this? Um, local, what is it, variable definition probably. Um, and we call this locals. Okay, so we have that. We can even make this read only if we wanted to. And then we have a method definition. And we call this current method. And then the way we do this here is we say an emit body. We say current method is method. We say locals clear. And then do that. And then we can say here in the variable declaration, we can say var variable definition is a new variable definition, variable and then the only thing we need is the type. So we say type reference is known types for node uh, variable dot type. Because variables in IL don't have names. The name exists only in the, in the debugging symbols because you know normally they are no longer relevant at that point. And then we can say locals add a node variable to variable definition. And we also have to say method body. Nope, what is this? Current. Current method. Screw it. Let's just call this method. Um, method dot body dot uh, variables dot add variable definition. Okay. Um, right. So now we say emit variable expression. Now we have to load the variable. So let's first find the variable definition. That would be variable uh, locals for our node or variable, right? Um, the way loading variables works in IL is it's called load arc, not load arc, uh, load local, I think. Um, and then you basically have the index, right? 0, 1, 2, and I believe Cecil is helpful, so I probably get away with saying uh, IL processor emit opcodes uh, load local and then the number, which in our case hopefully is just variable definition dot index. This time I'm going to see what we're actually emitting because I'm very skeptical. Oh, our processor has a body property. Hmm. Uh, yeah, maybe that's easier. Let me actually check for that. All right, here we go. So we say. 
what's your name, call write line, load string hello, call void. We have a local of type string. We load it here. Cool. Ah, yeah. So, okay, of course, of course, of course. Um, variable declarations, you're not the only thing you need to do. So, we now have emitted, uh, what is it, emit variable declaration. Uh, variable declaration also has an, ex has an initializer, right? So we also have to emit the initializer, emit expression, uh, which would be IL processor, and then node.initializer. Uh, our language forces that we always have initializer right now, um, so we can always assume it's there. And then we have to store it, right? And that's the same thing. We basically just say, um, we say IL processor emit opcodes store local. And then again, we need to pass in the uh, index. So hopefully that works. It seems to work. Like, I mean, it seems that pound uh, zero works. Probably you can do either though. And I think if I can do either, I'd probably do that because that seems more sensible. Um, so let's see what we have now. Yeah, so we have store local uh, load string. So now, in principle, if I run this, it should work. Nice. Right, so. Cool stuff is happening. Okay, now instead of swing point index, let's do this. Where do we have index? Let's see whether this still works. Still works. Sweet, let me do that. And then where do I say method right now? So IL processor uh, what is this thing called? Final references, shift F12, okay. No, not this one. This one. What is it the only place? Well in that case. Nice, nice, nice. All right, so that gives us quite something to work with already. So now I think the next thing we want to do, what time is it, 9.09? Okay, we're actually pretty good with time. Um, binary expression. So actually, let me first write the program again. Actually, let me first commit. So what do we have? We did. I guess we're going to commit this. Um, uh, emit input and variables. Okay, learn something new. All right, so binary expressions, right? So the way binary expressions works in IL is that they're not really built-in functions. They are effectively um, specific opcodes, right? So when you add to integers, there's an add instruction. If you have, uh, if you want to concatenate strings, then there is no add instru you know, instruction for strings. The way that works is you actually call string.concat. Well, that's what C sharp does. Actually, I can show you here. If we say, um, you know, var, what's happening here? 
if we say uh, let's say um, hello let's call this var name equals demo and we can say hello this and then we need of course a quote here so you can see what we do is we say load string store local and then it just calls string.concat right? and if you do multiple things if you say hello plus world um, then C sharp handles that as well and I think it supports up to I don't know four or five arguments or whatever and then eventually it gets let's actually test this Okay, now the compiler is, this is called constant folding, right? The compiler just creates a string literal that already is the concatenated version of that. So we have to force the compiler to not be able to do this by inserting some, some references here. And now basically now the compiler calls string dot, concat dot string that takes a string array, right? But logically that's what we have to do. So, and again, we can cheat. We, can, we don't have to flatten the binary thing. We can just always, um, effectively string concat two things and then if you have three things you string concat tonight twice right not as efficient but for the time being will work so that means we need string concat with that takes two two strings so let's import this guy um that would be somewhere here um let's call this string concat string concat and that would be on system string. The method is called concat, and it takes two system dot string. Right, right. Now we can say if node. Um, yeah, here's another question. How do we deal with this? Do we have a particular operator for this? I don't think we do. We just use plus for that, right? So let's just say if left type is type symbol string and node right type is node string um, then we handle this right now and yeah, I guess I'm not sure what's easier for us to deal with that but if node operator kind is what is this guy Bound binary operator kind, okay. Bound binary operator kind. Bound binary, really? Bound binary operator kind, uh, I don't know. Addition, maybe we should do it this way. Okay, this is crazy. Type symbol string. What's your problem now? If no left type. Here we go. Then we say emit expression node left, node right. And then we say uh, IL processor emit opcodes call for uh, what is it? Cons uh, string concat. And of course, we need to pass in the processor IL processor. 
right? Let me say throw new not implemented. Actually, let me throw this here. So let's see what is happening in our case. Um, No, it's always throwing. I think you're right. <laughs> it would have helped if you would have said return. Um, I guess you probably should have done this, right? That might be, structurally speaking, a little bit more logical. Even though there's some duplication, gets the point across. Um, and then we can, of course, remove the return here. Of course, we don't have actually a program that does anything meaningful yet. That was anticlimactic. Um, hello. Let's make it a bit more interesting. Let's see what we actually emitted. So, we call write line, and we call read line, we store the result, we load string hello, we, lo we load our name, we call string concat, we load this, this string, we call string concat again, and then we call write line. That seems right. So, very basic hello world, but we are getting there. I think we're getting into the rhythm of uh, emitting some IL. So, let's call this uh, add, or sorry, emit string concat. God, I suck at typing so much. Every time I do git commit on the command line, it always never works out. Because I always end up making typos. All right, so, so far so good. So any questions? Feel free to start a discussion in the chat. I'm more than happy to talk. <laughs> um, all right, so let's go over this thing again and see what will be the next logical step we can do. I guess loops would be nice, right? Yeah, we probably want some assignments before we do anything crazy with loops yet. So, and assignments are pretty straightforward. So all we have to do here is we have to say emit expression which is, which is the node expression. We have to find the variable definition. And then all we have to do here is we say store local for the variable definition. And of course, we have to say our processor, that guy. So now we are emitting store instructions. which means we can write a program slightly better. We can say, you know, uh, var name equals something. And then we can say this.
Okay, that worked really well. Interesting. So it seems, oh yeah, we are violating our contract. So here's what, hap what, here's what happened. So basically we said, you know, call read line. So basically read line and store local. So this is basically the assignment right now, which is assigning this local, the return of this thing here. And because this assignment, um, is an expression, it's contained in an expression statement. And as I said earlier, generally speaking with expression statements, you have to pop the value of the stack if you don't care about that expression. Which means in our case, you have a pop instruction here, but now there's nothing on the stack right now. So the stack is empty. And then we call pop on an empty stack. And that's why the CLR says this is not a valid program. And the reason this is the case is because in our language, similar to C++ and C, and I mean any C language really, um, actually I don't know any, but most C-based languages have assignments as expressions, which means you can have things like A equals B, A equals C equals D. Um, so that means when we emit um, our assignment, we also have to um, have the value of the expression on the stack as well. And the way we do this is we can either do this, right? Or we say this one and then we do this one again, right? We emit um, and then we say, uh, so now the expression is on, on the stack again, but now if this thing had side effects, which input does, now you're inputting twice, right? So we don't want to do that. And so the way we, you solve this problem is there's this other instruction which is called duplicate, which basically just takes the current value on the stack and pushes it again on the stack. And so this store instruction now is just writing the value into a local variable and then there's one value slot remaining, which is the value of the expression. So let me illustrate the problem here. So. Um, var other name um, other and then I can say other name equals name equals input and now let's uh, print other name here as well It would be actually harder to call that version and you'd also need to flatten the expression to get all the string arguments. I'm not sure what you mean. Are you talking about the string concat case where you have multiple things in there? I'm not confused. Why does this not print everything? Oh yeah, no, it works. Okay, so we print um, hello emo and we print emo, right? So now if we look at IL, here's our our first duplicate in order to store the local. And then we duplicate again. We store this in another local and then we pop. Sweet. Oh, I see. Why aren't we using the string, the array version of string concat? Yeah, so the reason we don't do that right now is because, uh, as Lucas said, it would have to flatten the tree, right? So let me try to illustrate. So when you do, when you have something like A, so if you, if you write A plus B plus C plus D, right? 
logically the way this is represented in the program is as a tree, right? So we have um, ASCII art for the win here. So we have a tree like this, and I think I hate myself that I, that I used that many examples here, so let's pretend I'd never mentioned D. So this is what the tree looks like, right? And so right now when we, when we emit a string concat, we first do a concat for A plus B, and then we do another string concat for the result of this, and then uh, plus this other guy, right? So in order for us to not do that, you would have to effectively flatten the tree, get that there is expression A, B, and C, that they're all plus together, right? And then you can say, okay, now, now emit you know, A, B, C, and then you can call a string concat. Uh, I guess now you have to say new, I don't even know what it looks like in, in, in IL, but like logically you do this, right? Something like this, and then you can saw a string concat uh, on what's basically currently on the stack, right? Which is the array. Um, so we can do that, but it's actually harder, right? Because you have to flatten the tree. If we, if we just always take pairs, then that's already trivial. I hope this makes sense. Um, now let me actually remove some stuff here. So we have, um, let's do this. Let's remove the name. All right, so now we have assignments. Emit assignments. Perfect. <clears throat> so what else can we do? OK, unary expressions is quite a bit of work. Uh, conversion expressions are potentially some work. Um, yeah, let's deal with label statements and go tos. I mean, let's do return first because returns are trivial. So we should be able to do that at least. So let's do. Um, Uh, basically, it's emit node expression, emit expression for IL processor this. However, we use returns also in functions that don't return values, so we'd only do this if there is an expression. And then we can just say IL processor uh, emit opcodes return. OK, so now let's try this. Let's actually have, oh yeah, get name. What we haven't done really is uh, emitted our function headers correctly. So that's the other thing we probably should do. And then we can say let name equals get name. Right? So far, so good. Um, the problem is, right now in our function declaration, we always emit the void type and we always emit no arguments, right? So that's clearly not the right thing. So instead of showing type symbol void here, we need to say function.return type or function.type. And then we have to say for each var. Uh, function dot parameters. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder whether I can code at all. Like I just look at the code and I'm like, this does not look like somebody who actually knows what they're doing. Like it's it's fundamentally <laughs> frustrating. All right, so okay for each parameter, I think it's similar in IL. We need to say method dot parameters dot add, and then we say var parameter 
definition equals new parameter definition. Those guys have names. Parameter name. Let's call this the function type. And then we call this the uh, God, parameter type, parameter type. And this is the parameter dot type. And then we pass this guy in. And then I think all you have to do is add this guy, right? Parameter definition. Yeah, that's not encouraging confidence here, what's happening. There is no argument given that corresponds to the required form parameter parameter type of parameter definition string compared to time of parameter attributes. Excuse me, parameter attributes is parameter attributes, what is it? Uh, has default, has field marshal is in, else it none, optional out, return value unused. None seems like a reasonable value to pass in here. Okay. All right, so first let's see whether this actually works already. And then we will add a parameter to that function. Is that the code monkey keyboard bashing syndrome? Yeah, I think that's, I think if you go to Wikipedia and you search for this, there's a picture of me, I, I'm pretty sure. Um. Yes, uh, Neomal 4 g is saying that seeing IL in SharpLab, it doesn't have native param support. That's right, so IL has no notion of params. Params is a, there's an encoding in IL so that methods can express themselves as being params, but it's purely syntactic sugar in the language. The compiler is expected to create the array. IL does not do that for you. All right, so this worked, shockingly. So let's change this a little bit so that we convince ourselves that it's actually being called. So how about this? We had another function here, just for shits and giggles. We call this uh, 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 get get read line, and we say prompt of type string. And then we say, we print this guy. And then we say, this guy is a uh, read line. Who are you? Uh, well, let's do proper German. Name. Not even bother with like <laughs> anything like a sentence. All right, so then let's remove this guy here. And then let's see what happens. I think my compiler didn't compile. Or maybe it did and crashed. <laughs> uh, The build failed. Exit of code minus something. Yeah, this is the part where. Uh, really? I'm. That's unfortunate. So the compiler does build. So that means you probably crashed in the compiler, would be my guess. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, instead of doing this, let's first try to see whether we can find uh, more diagnostic. What happens if I invoke MS build on this guy? Does that print more data? It does. Here we go. The given key prompt string was not present in the dictionary. See, isn't that nice? The key not found exception tells you what key didn't find. And in this case, it absolutely helps. So what I, what I know from this now, maybe we should also remove this absurd command line from the output, um, is it says this key cannot be found. And this key I know is the, is the two string of a parameter symbol. And so effectively what ends up happening here is we, we, we try to access a parameter because we treat the parameter as a local, right, emit variable expression. So now we say, well, in the locals, find me this guy. And that doesn't work. So in order for us to do the right thing here, emit variable expression, um, we have to differentiate between locals and parameters. And frankly, in our language, this is trivial. We can say if node is, so if node dot symbol, no, node dot variable is a parameter symbol, then do this, else do this. And so in order for us to emit uh, parameters correctly. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we were not clever. If we would have been clever, we would have recorded in the parameter the position. Which, as a fun fact, who's creating this guy? Final references. So the binder creates this guy. The binder clearly knows the position here. But the built-in things, we clearly know it as well. You know what? Let's just change this. So string type, and then we say int ordinal. And ordinal basically tells us what is the what is the index of the of the parameter effectively. Um, now, of course, I have to change this guy here. And uh, fortunately, that is very easy. That is parameters count. And then this guy here. It's also trivial because we know it's zero and we know it's zero. Right? Right. And so now the only thing I have to do now is to say, well, in that case, it's load arc. And I can just literally pass in parameter dot ordinal. That works in our case because in our case, all functions are known to be static. Uh, the way IL works is that for instance methods, uh, arc zero is to this pointer. And then the actual first argument is arc one. And for static methods, arc zero is literally the first argument, right? So that's, that's all working very logical. So now let's see what ends up happening if we build this again. And it worked out. So let's look at IL. So a read line method. Um, we say Lord arc zero, which is our prompt. Then we call write line with that. Then we call read line with that. 
I shouldn't say with that, we just call read line. We store the result of read line in, in the first local, we load the first local, we return. And then in our main, we just say load string name, we call string read line, we store the result of read line, we load the string hello, we load the, uh, the, yeah, the value of the first variable, we call concat, we load this string, we call concatenate again, and then we call write line and we return. All right, so that means, in principle, this should work. Oh, Brian. <laughs> Has TerraJobs learned to monitor the chat yet? I'm pretty sure I'm doing better than I used to, but I'm also pretty sure I'm nowhere near as cool as you are, Brian. Like, the, for, some, for, for example, Brian has these amazing games that people can play in chat. Um, here the only game you can play is try to get Imo's attention so he actually answers the question. That's the only game we have here. <laughs> well, Brian is even having his own emojis. That's, that's much better than what I have. Well, but I have a compiler that can print my name. That's kind of like the nerd's version of an emoji, right? Anyway, so we have this one now. So now we can actually emit parameters as well, which means we have actually the ability to call functions. Isn't that neat? All right, let's, um, let's commit some stuff here. So let's start with this one here. Uh, and then these guys. And then these guys. And let's call this um, add parameter symbol dot ordinal. And now we can say, let's do this one first. Um, and then maybe do this one. And let me say, add support for non void functions. Right? That seems reasonable. Um, and then we can say this is uh, add support for parameters. Yep. Uh, add support for parameters. Well, let's reset this because we don't care. This is just our playground. All right, so far I'm actually liking this. This is going, this is going places. So we can collapse return statement because it's done. This one is done. Um, this one is obviously done. Literals are done. Uh, variables are done. Uh, we don't have support for globals yet, but that's fine. Um, Globals are generally a problem. So I recently noticed that the way we do globals is actually not great. There will be another episode on how we fix the globals. Um, emit assignment expression. Okay, unary and binary is incomplete. Um, call, I think, is done except for the built-in function R&D, which is more complicated. So we'll skip that one as well. Conversions. Yeah, conversions we should probably deal with. And then we have our state, our labels. So I think, honestly, I'm quite content with what we have and call this a day. Um, I feel like we made a lot of progress. And then next time we will, we will deal with um, uh, actual loop constructs here. Because once we have these three here, we have all loops. And then we deal with the binaries and we deal with the conversions, which are very similar to binaries in many ways, or function calls for that matter. Um, so yeah, I think this is a, 
This is a good, good end result. Ouch, I'm saving this one for your code. Um, <laughs> Sorry, last time I was spamming the chat and no response. Yeah, it's hard. It's, um, I don't know how people do this, honestly. Like the, the thing is, it's one thing to do something and then monitor the chat. So for example, community standups, I think we're doing better with the chat because all we do is talking. But I don't know, when I code, it's very easy for me to slip in the zone and then not pay attention to the chat. So I, I find it hard to do something non-trivial and monitor the chat. I, it, it takes a lot of practice, I think. <laughs> Ryan is saying he's just jealous of how freaking smart you are. No, I mean, I'm not that smart. I mean, I think this is hopefully very clear by watching me code. Like, I, the only difference I think between me and the people watching here is that I spend a lot of time reading compiler code bases, right? So most of the things you see here that you think are clever or smart, they are nowhere near my idea, right? They're just things I picked up from other people, um, especially the Rosalind Architecture in general does a lot for your compiler, in my opinion. It makes a really clean separation between the, the front end portion of the parser um, and then the back end portion. And I, I feel like this is something that uh, I was completely missing. As I said, like I, I read a bunch of books and I, I wrote a full compiler myself um, and none of this stuff was obvious. Right? Now when you look at Rosden or you look at the structure that I have here, it feels very natural, it feels obvious, right? But when you're actually trying to come up with that stuff, it's not that easy. So I would say that smartness is very relative, right? I think we all suffer from imposter syndrome to a certain extent, and that is usually a sign of us just being surrounded by really smart people, right? And um, so in that sense, yeah, don't be, don't be discouraged by some of the stuff you see here that feels very smart because I feel, very, I feel very similar. I can take no credit for 99% of what you see here. All right. <laughs> Neomar4G is saying, everyone is thinking it, I'm just going to say it. IL Imolandworth. Fun story, when I joined Microsoft, one of the first things you have to decide is, what is your alias? And which, which is basically your username and your uh, your email address, if you will. And um, I tried to get IL at Microsoft.com because I was joining the runtime team, right? So I felt like it makes sense. You know, it's my initials, it's, it would be cool. And the response from MSIT was, sorry, we don't do two letter <laughs> emails. Um, so unfortunately I'm stuck with this long form of my name. But I mean, the nice thing with MOL is that it's very unique, and it's not much more to type than IL. IL is probably not that unique at Microsoft, so it's probably a prefix of hundreds of names. I haven't checked, but too many names. And the other thing I know from some coworkers is you don't want to be confused. If you constantly get somebody else's emails, that's not great. <laughs> so don't do that. Uh, IL doesn't, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, we kind of have IL doesn't, right? And I already have the command called IL, so I'm just too lazy to type IL Desm all the time. It's not like the lesser Scots. Yeah, the lesser Scots, like that's just amazing, right? I think we now have a rule on the team that if, you, if your first name is Scott, you're destined for a management career. That's, uh, and so my name is not Scott, so I'm not going to be a manager. <laughs> I'm a manager, I mean people that have reports, right? I don't have reports. Uh, my title has program manager, but program managers are not managers, so ignore that. Yeah, oh, IELTSM at Microsoft.com, that could backfire. Oh, for sure. Uh, if you have not used IELTSM in a while, IELTSM is a, is a tool that we have in the .NET SDK that uh, is a GUI effectively for the things I do here. And uh, it's very rough. Uh, the, the code base is not super pleasant. Yeah. Alrighty, so I think this is it. All right, friends, so today we extended our emit operations. We're now actually able to emit Hello World for reals, not as a hard-coded project. Uh, we have a decent language coverage, um, so I'm actually somewhat confident that uh, we only have one more episode and then we should be handling virtually all constructs in our language and emit IL for that. Um, so I'm quite happy with where we are. Um, 
I hope you are too. So make sure to subscribe, follow on whatever is necessary to make sure that you don't miss out on the, on the next episodes. And then uh, I hope to see you next week.